and good evening, lazies and junior mints. Welcome aboard. It is 7 p.m. Sunday evening here in my part of the world. And whatever time of the world in whatever part of time that you are is what it is. So, peace, man. Uh, good evening, Kelly. Jerry, hey, what up? Becca, good evening, Becca. Jeremy, hello, Jeremy, thank you. Jay Bear, hey, how you doing? Let's see, who else is here? Barban, Emily, Lenara, nice, hello, nice to see you, Cliff. And there's <laughs> Charlie Bronson. So we got Sluggo and Charlie Bronson going on. Hi, Nancy, good to see you. Hello, Carl, good evening to you too. Anyway, good to see you all. It has been a, um, as usual, a sort of a slam bang, crazy weekend. Hi, Regina. Regina? Regina. Probably Regina. Um, again, I'm always guessing on these things, but uh, Kenneth, good to see you too. Um, I am just, uh, you know, we're kind of messing and messing and messing. Steve, lovely to see you, dude. Steve, who's just checked in here, um, actually used to be my student many, many years ago. He is now a grown man with a family, kid, all that stuff. Um, and and uh, it's still wonderful to see him. And Isabella, Isabella, Isabella. Um, anyway, good to see you too. And uh, I would say Mr. Williams is my dad, except he's not. Um, <laughs> Uh, the guy who, whose my last name comes from was my biological father, who I don't know anything about. So my dad actually has a different last name. My stepdad uh, is uh, a different last name than I do. Um, but he's still my real dad, even though he's not my biological dad. Anyway, what else was I going to say? I'm trying to remember, because um, as usual, I'm slightly confused. It's uh, The weekends are weird because of the hours. Because um, once I finish reading at 3 o'clock in the morning, I literally cannot get to sleep for at least a couple of hours. So Saturdays, I'm always up. Uh, Saturday nights, I'm always up to like 5 or so in the morning. And then we have, until very recently, we have had a regular thing where we have a check-in Skype call with a dear friend of ours who is in the process of moving to England in the midst of a pandemic, which is very complicated and made even more complicated because she's also trying to get her dog there um, at the same time and not leave him stranded somewhere. So uh, we check in with her every Sunday about noon. So it means I kind of have to kind of come crawling out of bed after only four or five hours of sleep to be relatively compost mentis for conversations. And so I wind up just like, as I think I've said before, kind of jet lagged for the whole weekend. Yes, Kelly, absolutely unwashed and somewhat slightly dazed. Nice, nice Bowie quote. Um, and uh, hello, Regina, again. Yes, stepdads are awesome. I have a great one. Um, and who, last I heard, we I think news has been so decent on my dad's part lately that um, I haven't even checked in in the last few days just because there's been other stuff going on. But, you know, he seems to be doing very well and recovering well. So thank you all for all your kind words and comments on that. And um, I told him that many people online had sent messages to him. Um, and uh, But even my dad is not brave enough probably to wade through the chaos that is my Facebook page and the extensive silliness of all my social media to find the people who said nice things to him. So I just told him. I kind of summed it up. Anyway, what else do we need to talk about? Not much, really. We had I had another weird problem with Google Chrome last night where I couldn't get, um, for some reason, I couldn't get the uh, broadcast to start. I, I did everything on my end correctly, and for some reason, it just it started, but nobody could see it. Um, it nevertheless showed up on the page, which was unlike what happened with the privacy problem that I've now solved, although I have to still go in each time and say, Yes, I'm doing a live broadcast. No, I'm not doing it just for me, which is a weird, a weird kind of monomaniacal thought. You know, yeah, I'm going to do these live broadcasts just to myself because nobody else deserves to see me. <laughs> anyway, um, so what else? So anyway, so just to warn you, we did have that weird thing. I don't know why that's happening. I don't know why anything that happens with Google Chrome happens because I'm normally... Uh, 
use a different browser because I'm a Mac guy and as a result I tend to use Safari. But Safari is not allowed to do the live broadcasts for some reason. I, I have no idea what kind of backsheesh has been handed around in the back rooms of Silicon Valley to make that happen. Probably somewhat similar to the amount of backsheesh that got handed around in the California legislature to make sure everybody has to do an eye exam every year if they want to replace their contact lenses or something. The world is full of weird little scams. Um, anyway, so that's where we're at. Um, I am still reading from A War of the Flowers. Here it is with Michael Whalen's lovely cover. Um, unfortunately, it's paperback, so it's a very small version, but believe me, with already having bad joints and all over me. Um, the last thing I want to do is try to hold up a hardcover if I can avoid it. So I use paperbacks when possible and preferably beat up old paperbacks like this that I've already used for some other research oriented purpose or simply to prop up a short leg on a table or something like that. Anyway, so I think without further ado then I can just start reading. Um, Last time when I was reading, we had gotten to the part where Theo had uh, awoken in the Daisy, uh, on the Daisy Commune in the house of Dr. Tansy. Um, he had been saved from the river, it turned out, by Applecore and two large ogres named Dolly and Teddy Bear. But because he had not gotten permission from the local nymph to fling himself into the river, which he did to keep himself alive, um, he, when he woke up, Applecore informed him that he had had to have a nymph binding, so he has an unbreakable strip of grass tied around his wrist, which means that later on, at some point, he will have to come to terms with that particular bargain of being allowed to leave. So that's, uh, oh, and then so Theo went for, uh, met Tansy, who didn't actually seem to like humans very much, um, and discovered that the person from Hollyhock, excuse me, I've got some kind of aardvark in my eye. Um, the uh, person who came from the Hollyhock family, which was one of the other sympathetic families sympathetic toward mortals among the fairy nobility, who were also called the flowers. Um, and uh, the only bit of the Hollyhock uh, envoy who was coming to pick Theo up and take him to a convocation in the city, um, the only part of him that arrived, however, was his heart carefully wrapped up in paper and put in a chest, a wooden chest, and uh, sent to Dr. Tansy. So the implication, of course, is that somebody was making a statement about how unwanted Theo the mortal is in fairyland. So then the last thing we read was that Theo, uh, after being stuck in his room for a while, after being dismissed by Tansy and with everything hanging and no resolution as to how, if ever, he was going to get back because Applecore had mentioned to him something about the fact that uh, you can only go to and from and it takes a great deal of magical energy. Um, Theo went for a walk around Tansy's house and quickly became lost and was only um, only sent back by uh, contacting the Hob, who is a bodiless voice in the household um, who is, has given him directions to go back. So that's where we are. So I'll just read the last paragraph or two of that and then we will go forward with tonight's reading. He hadn't sensed her arriving, if that was what she'd done, but he did sense her going. It was an odd departure, something barely perceived, like a light going out in a building he'd been watching while thinking of something else. It's all magic, he thought. This whole world works on magic, and I don't understand any of it. Man, I'm in trouble here. Even with the directions, he had to retrace his steps three times before he found the kitchen, because he did not at first realize that turn right at the end of the corridor, then turn right again immediately, meant just that. After he had gone up and down the close-ended corridor several times, looking for a place to make the second right, when there clearly was no such place, he tried to be a bit more literal. He went back to the ornamental tree, then walked to the end of the hall again. As soon as he had made the right turn into the corridor, he immediately turned right once more, bracing against the smack in the nose he expected when he hit the wall. But suddenly there was no wall there. The kitchen was a high room of pale stone and dark floor tiles, huge and warm, 
agleam with hanging brass pots and pans. At the far end, a small, bristly figure stood on a stool. Sorry, at the far end, a small, bristly figure on a stool was leaning over a huge, shiny stovetop, alternating between shouting up into the rafters and doing something that looked like conducting opera. Nearer stood a long refectory table. There were only a few people sitting at it, less than a dozen, but it looked like a lot more because two of them were ogres. Oi! Pinky! shouted Dolly. Her voice made the crockery vibrate in the hutches. There goes the neighborhood, rumbled Teddy Bear. As Theo stood warily in the doorway, the ogre's companions turned and examined him with interest. They were the size of small children, round-faced and more or less human, dressed in matching gray uniforms that gave the scene the air of break time at some Munchkinland fast food restaurant. The little people had long, curling eyebrows, and the males, Theo thought he was on fairly solid ground here, sported wide, fluffy beards. Can I, can I come in? He asked. Of course you can, said Dolly cheerfully. We were just telling the others about you. You were. Teddy Bear belched a drawn out noise like a garbage truck hefting a dumpster. I was eaten. The lights went out. It was strange to be relieved to see anything as ugly as the ogre siblings. Or did that happen only where I was? Happens all the time these days, said Teddy Bear. Power plant workers having a little holiday or, or something. Somebody needs to grind a few of those light lazy bastards into jelly. You hungry? Dolly asked Theo. Not for jelly, he said. Not now. Come, join us. She gestured for him to sit next to her and pulled a basket full of bread closer to the edge of the table. She elbowed her brother to move over, leaving a tiny sliver of bench between the massive gray bodies. The little people watched avidly as Theo wiggled into the space. It's like taking my bike in between two semis, he thought. If either one of them twitches, I'll be nothing but a smear. He settled in gingerly. Yeah, actually, I am sort of hungry. Are you allowed to eat? The ogress asked as the little people whispered among themselves. Uh, allowed? Isn't there something about mortals eating our food and then the, uh, their heads blow up or something? What? Teddy Bear shook his head. Yeah, doll. You talk a lot of old fumets sometimes. Their heads don't blow up. That's silly. They turn purple all over and die. And it's not just from eating. It happens even if they just put some stone in their mouth or even just jump over some branches. Mortals can die from doing just about anything here. Theo, who had been reaching for a piece of bread, pulled back his hand. What are you talking about? I I is this a joke? One of the little people on the far side of the table stood up on the bench, so his head was on the same level as Theo's. They're giving you a bad time, Stepstool. He sounded like he just won the helium breathing finals. Mortals don't die from eating our food. They just can't go back to Mortalia again. Mortalia, one of the others asked. Well, where mortals come from, the little first little man explained smugly. What the hell does a brownie know, demanded Teddy Bear. He sounded angry, but considering that he could have stuffed half a dozen of the little people into his mouth at one time, they didn't seem very alarmed. You're all idiots. Our mom told us the story. We're all about this mortal boy named Percy Fawn and how he'd covered himself with grease so he could slip through the door to here from, from the mortal place. But he ate some palmy granite and he died. Mortals don't eat rocks, sod skull. Dolly rolled her eyes. Do they, Pinky? You don't eat rocks, do you? Theo's hands were now in his lap. Despite the cramping of his empty stomach, he didn't want to touch anything that might be food. His head blowing up might be a fitting end to a very difficult day, but although he doubted that would really happen, he didn't feel like taking any chances, especially with the possibility of not being able to go home. No, he said. No, we don't eat rocks. All right, it wasn't granite then, said Teddy Bear. Miss Clever. But it was something like that. He ate it, then he tried to go home, but he fell over some sticks and died. 
You said they turned purple, Dolly pointed out. Mortals, I mean. Fall over some sticks, turn purple, then die. Theo could only sit and listen to his stomach rumble while they argued over the top of him. The brownies seemed to think it was all very funny. Chapter, chapter 13, A Change in the Weather. Of course you get bloody well eat, Applecore informed him as she led him down the hall from the kitchen toward Tansy's lab. What else are you going to do, you dick? Live on air? But, but the ogres said, ogres! She buzzed across the antechamber so briskly he almost had to run to keep up. There's a reason Tansy didn't send one of them after you, you know. Even Dolly. And she's a bleeding genius by ogre standards. Couldn't find her arse with both hands in a treasure map. And our Teddy can't count to eleven without unbuttoning his trousers. She gave him a tiny shove toward the door into the lab. Inside, his host stood, waiting, arms crossed on his chest. He hasn't eaten anything since he's been here, sir, Applecore announced. Because the ogres have been giving him so old, some old shite about how it will keep him from getting home again. What? Tansy appeared startled as if he had been miles away. Oh, oh he hasn't eaten, he spoke to the air. Fetch in some food for Master Vilmos. Certainly, Count Tansy, said the sweetly reasonable hob voice. I'm very sorry. Tansy told Theo. When you first arrived, I was quite absorbed. I should have asked you if you'd eaten. Terrible way to treat a guest. My apologies. Theo could not help staring. A few hours earlier, the fairy had looked at him like he was a bug. Now he was treating him like a real guest. What the hell was that about? I, I just... It took a moment to shake off his surprise. Dolly and her brother, they told me... If I eat here, I can't go back. It's some um, old story, apparently. Tansy nodded. It's just that, I'm afraid. An old story. I have no doubt it has some basis in truth, mind you. I, I would guess that in the old days, when there was little to inhibit travel between your lands and ours, it was easier for a mortal to dally here and forget to cross back, so that by the time he returned, the slippage would have meant a terrible dislocation on his return. Slippage? Yes, the differences between our two worlds. The passage of time is perhaps the most obvious symptom, but not the only one. But eating or not eating has nothing to do with whether or not a traveler may return, then or now. I suspect it was a sort of ploy devised by wise mortals to keep your kind from staying here too long. If they left without eating, and hence only stayed as long as they could last on an empty stomach, the disruption would not be too great. Disruption? A female brownie had walked silently into the room, wheeling a cart with a tray on it. At least Theo assumed she'd walked, although he hadn't actually seen her enter. She was plump and rosy-cheeked and quite ordinary in her proportions, as though someone had simply shrunk a slightly short-legged young woman to about three and a half feet high. Where, sir? she asked. Tansy nodded toward a low table. The brownie put the tray of fruit and bread on a table, dropped a curtsy, then pushed her cart back out of the room. The fairy lord gestured for Theo to take the leather-cushioned chair next to the table, which had a casual elegance that suggested it was Tansy's own. Theo seated himself a little apprehensively. Applecore squatted down beside the plate, sniffing. Ooh, eglantine, honey, she said. That's nice, but uh, help yourself. He turned back to Tansy. So it's really all right if I eat. He didn't want to be stubborn, but it was hard to believe the cool-eyed creature of a few hours earlier was suddenly itching to be his buddy old pal. I'll still be able to go back home. Eating this or any other wholesome food will have no effect on whether or not you can go back, Tansy said. I swear by the oldest trees. Theo looked to Applecore for a clue as to what was going on, but she didn't seem worried for him. In fact, she was scooping huge dollops of butter and honey off his bread with her hands and licking them off, so the food certainly wasn't poisoned or anything that crude. What did he call you? A sprite? Theo asked her. Is the definition by any chance mouth like a sailor, manners like a tiny flying pig? 
She grinned behind a smear of honey. Shut up and eat, you great big waster. He broke off a corner of bread and picked a fruit that looked like salmon-colored cherry. The bread tasted like bread, only much better. But the fruit was like nothing else he'd ever had. The bold sweetness undercut by a certain perfumed tang. A wonderful, exotic flavor. He was reminded again that he was starvingly hungry, and he scooped up a whole handful. As I said, I'm very sorry for my earlier abruptness, Tansy proclaimed. I was preoccupied, but I have given the matter more thought and realized that it is still important for my principles to meet you, and also that you should not be left to fend for yourself in what must be a very disconcerting new world. Theo still didn't trust the situation. Tansy was fairly convincing as a nice guy, but it was hard to ignore the earlier behavior. Theo couldn't help wondering what might have happened during the course of the day to change things. Or was that just what these flowers were like, these high-powered fairy folk? Able to shut off or turn on simulated emotions at will, like real-world sociopaths? It wasn't the most comfortable thought. Either I'm paranoid or they're totally freaky. Two great choices. Could you just send me back instead? He asked. I, I mean, no offense, but I didn't want to come here in the first place. I really don't need to meet anyone. Ah, but you do. Tansy smiled brightly. Theo thought for a disturbing moment that the ascetic white-haired creature was going to walk over and chummily thump him on the back. Surely you haven't forgotten about the spirit who found you back in your home and attacked you. Not much chance of that. That sort of entity will not be long thrown off your scent and could not be avoided forever, even if you could cross back and forth between your world and ours every day. As it is, once you have settled back down into your normal life again, it will easily find you. And next time you will not have Mistress Applecore to help you or a door through which to escape. Theo remembered the thing's raw face and oozing eyes. He suddenly felt clammy under the arms. So what are you saying? That it's just going to get me someday, no matter what? We hope not. But it will take a more, cun more cunning mind than mine, or a, a better equipped laboratory, to find exactly what the thing is and remove it or placate it. That is another reason why you should go to my friends in the city. They are better connected than I am, closer to the seats of power, and that means all sorts of power. I have chosen the life of a poor country philosopher and scientist, you see. You said another reason. What's the first reason? Theo suddenly wondered if Tansy or his allies might have set the corpse thing on him themselves just to make sure he did what they wanted. Why me? You said there were these, I don't, I don't know, groups, political parties, and one of them wanted to talk to me or something. Why? I am not at liberty to disclose too much in case you... Tansy hesitated, then began again. You see, you will have to travel a long way, and... Apparently deciding this was just as unproductive a tangent, he pulled a stool out from behind one of the equipment-covered tables and sat down on it, his long legs bent at the knees. He wore what looked like very expensive fawn suede slippers with no socks. Let me explain a little. He pulled out his glasses and put them on, then leaned over to look at a display on one of his desktop instruments. He waved his hand over it, and the screen changed from silvery to a sparkling blue-green. A cloud of mist drifted up from the screen, but quickly evaporated as he turned back to Theo and Applecore. Your race, Master Vilmos, and my race have lived in each other's shadows a long, long time. Not always in harmony, it has to be said. When we first noted the rise of your kind, there were some of our folk who thought we should... He paused. Thought you should what? Theo demanded. Wipe us out like bugs? Tansy waved a negligent hand. Let's not get sidetracked. Sidetracked? Like that's a small matter? The fact is, despite early doubts, our two races have managed to share the world a long time. 
uh, not the world as you know it, I should make clear, but the world as we both know it. It is not really one world, you see. They overlap, or rather they coexist, your world and our world, although not always in the physical plane. Physical plane. Overlapping worlds. Theo was irritated by Tansy skipping over what was clearly an important part of the story, namely the actual desire of some fairies to bump off all humans. He was being treated like a child, which made him want to act like one on purpose. This is beginning to sound like astrology or something, he said, slouching back in his chair. I, I hate that stuff. I had a girlfriend once who was always telling me that I was retrograde or something, when what she really meant was that I was being an asshole. Tansy's smile regained a little of its earlier wintry chill. Yes. Well, without going into too much detail, in deference to your undoubted fatigue, suffice it to say that while our two races used to share the physical and metaphysical bounty of the world very closely, we have grown apart over the years, and our needs have changed. I suppose the easiest way to say it is that your people now take much more from the earth than we do. And I am not talking about the spinning globe, the actual planet with its topsoil and air, but about something a bit more intangible. In a way, it is like two towns built on the same lake. Your town has begun to pump away a far larger share of the clean water, and to return those waters to the lake fouled. This is about pollution? He bit down on a pit and grimaced. None of the other fairy fruits had contained pits. He spat it out carefully onto his hand and put it on the corner of the plate. Applecore, who had eaten quite a bit of honey and a few berries, rose unsteadily into the air and lit on Theo's shoulder. Nothing so simplistic or so physical, said Tansy, but the analogy may stand. Let us simply say that you mortals are overutilizing and befouling our shared environment. He leaned back in his chair and looked over the tops of his glasses. It has a great deal to do with changing beliefs. Huh? Changing beliefs, or more specifically, the diminishing of belief in what you call magic in your world, and which we think of as the true science. There have been several nexus points when things have changed in both worlds. Some of them you would undoubtedly recognize as important milestones in your own world, when things have grown rapidly and significantly worse here. Most of these nexus points have had to do with voyages of discovery or moments of human innovation, but some simply with the brutalization of imagination there and the atrophy of childhood. Each point significantly changed your world and simultaneously reduced the power available to us here and thus made our lives harder and emptier. Your last hundred years have been the worst of all for us. When it was realized what was happening, several changes came to our society. One was that we began to try new methods to use our resources more effectively, forcing us in a way to ape your race's path what you call progress. Another was that debating how to respond to these changes became the dominant political issue of our society, at least among those of us far-sighted enough to recognize the problem. Or those with time on their hands because they don't have to work for a living. Applecore whispered loudly in Theo's ear. Oddly, she sounded a little tipsy, although he hadn't seen her drink even water. Thus, Tansy continued, we have our major parties in this disagreement. First, there are the symbiotes who believe that the continued rise of humanity is inevitable and that we must therefore find a way to live in the shadow of your race and subsist on your leavings, much like certain birds and fish who clean the hides or the teeth of larger and more dangerous animals. The symbiotes themselves put a braver face on it, but it is really nothing more than parasitism. He's talking about those creepers I told you about, whispered Applecore. Then there are the extremists on the other side, those who believe there can be no accommodation with a race like yours, with a species that does not even recognize what it is on the verge of destroying. 
These are the excisors. He frowned at apple core. The chokeweeds, as commoners call them. Yup, she giggled. Chokeweeds. The excisors believe the only solution is to remove ourselves from the influence of your kind entirely. To be fair, there are some few in this group, scientists and philosophers for whom I have respect, who would like to find a way simply to separate your race and ours so that we could each live unaffected by the other. But they are the minority. Most of the rest would like to destroy, disrupt, or subjugate your civilization. Lately, they seem to be losing patience with the normal and legitimate workings of the Parliament of Blooms. It is feared that they may even seek a more direct confrontation with those of us who disagree. Theo was doing his best to make sense of this. It was similar to what Applecore had told him, but had more long words in it. And you're part of which group? As I said before, I think I am one of the co-extensives. Believers in the middle path. We feel we must find a way to live with your kind, but not necessarily simply by giving in. We have been active in very small ways, even in your world, influencing events where we can. We have some surprisingly well-connected friends. Rich mortal loonies, Applecore whispered loudly, then laughed so hard that she slipped off Theo's shoulder and had to beat her wings hard to keep from falling to the floor. She hovered near his elbow, still chortling. Humans who want to believe. And fairies, she did a mid-air loop. Agents? Theo looked at her, worried. Oh, by the name of... Tansy stared at Applecore's oscillating flight. Hob? Hob? When were those berries picked? Last autumn, sir, the bodiless voice responded, when they were ripe. Curses. The fermentation pixies must have gotten into them, or at least enough to make the sprite here drunk as a selkie on shore leave. He got up and walked over to one of the standing cabinets, then pulled open the drawer. There, you wayward dot, there is a pile of towels. Lie down and sleep it off. Applecore bumbled around near Theo's face for a moment. Now, much weight, you see, she said. Me, I mean, don't take much. That's what all the boys say, she hiccuped. Don't let him give you any of those berries, she told Theo in a stage whisper. They're mad. The sprite flew unsteadily toward the drawer and disappeared into it. Within moments, Theo could hear a soft but incredibly high-pitched snore, like someone drawing a bow back and forth above the bridge of a violin. Well, after that interruption, I've forgotten what I was saying. Tansy shook his head. Something about the party you support. Ah, the coextensives. Well, we have our own agenda, but we definitely eschew the extremes. Desperate, violent measures are not needed. Not yet, anyway, and not for the foreseeable future. But neither can we simply let our destinies be written by other hands. Theo heard the unmistakable beginnings of a party political commercial. But what about me? Where do I fit into all this? Tansy swiveled toward him, clearly annoyed, then carefully made his face neutral again. Ah, yes, you, Master Vilmos. So he's not that good at hiding his feelings after all, Theo decided. Or else he's playing an even weirder game than I thought. I can't tell you what my contacts want of you. And that is not by my choice, the fairy added hurriedly. It is because I do not know. Some of the most important members of Parliament are involved, both coextensives and symbiotes, and they have not made me privy to the substance of their interest, but they want to see you. Probably about my great uncle's book, Theo said. Why don't you just give that to them? If they're happy with it, then they can let me go home. Tansy shook his head. Sadly, it does not work that way. My orders were explicit to send you to the city where they could meet with you in person. They were most forceful about that. Theo suddenly realized that Tansy's change of attitude might have come about because he had talked with these superior, powerful folk 
and they had let him know that they very much still wanted to see Theo, late or not. Which means what? That I have a little power in this situation? But if so, he didn't want to waste it with Tansy, who, whether or not he was faking this newfound courtesy, was beginning to seem like a mere functionary. So I have to go. Tansy nodded, almost a small bow. I regret it, but yes, you must. But they killed the first person who was coming to escort me, you said. Someone definitely killed him. How am I going to find this place I'm supposed to go to? And how am I going to get past whatever killed that hollyhock guy? And what if the dead thing comes after me again? Yes, those are all problems. I have been thinking on the matter carefully. To show you how seriously I take this situation and how I regret my earlier behavior, I really was very distracted, as I believe I told you. I will send a member of my own family with you. Uh, thanks, but I think I'd rather have one of the ogres. They may not be the, the best company, but I bet nobody would... He paused to rephrase. I, I bet nobody would mess with me if I had an ogre along. Tansy shook his head. Oh, oh, no, most unsuitable. For one thing, they are needed here. They are personal bodyguards on loan to me from my brother. Not to mention that they are of great help moving equipment here in the lab. For another, you betray your ignorance of our society. To travel with ogres in attendance is to signal yourself part of the highest flower nobility, and thus to attract attention. Someone would very quickly wonder why an unknown like you could afford two such large and dangerous servants. Oh, and they won't notice me without them? Not if you wear the proper clothes, and we make some other adjustments to disguise your appearance as well. Mostly it is your color, that brash, brownish tone to your skin. It makes you look like a laborer. Well, that describes my general position in society pretty well, if you add boneheaded and ungrateful to it. Tansy gave him a sour look. I will have all the details seen to, so there is no need for worry. I will send someone to help you with disguising yourself. Uh, okay, we hide my tan, so people think I'm an ordinary middle-class fairy. Theo shook his head. This all makes me feel like this trip is going to be a little more dangerous than you've been letting on. Who's this relative you're going to send with me? Do not worry, Master Vilmos. It will be easier than you fear. Come to me in the morning when you are up and dressed, and we will finish the preparations. Tansy turned his back on Theo and then seemed to remember himself. Uh, uh, can you find your way back to your room by yourself, Master Vilmos? Hob can take you straight there or give you directions. Uh, that would help. Otherwise, you might never see me again. Yes, that's true. He said it quite seriously. By the way, would you take this inebriated sprite with you? I have work to do. Theo picked Applecore out of the drawer and cradled her in his hand. Her little eyes opened blearily for a moment, and then she let out a minuscule belch, smiled, and went back to sleep. They are like starlings, said Tansy, frowning. Never silent and rude as can be. Theo felt an urge to defend his only friend in this otherworldly place, but from his own experience he had to admit the fairy lord was speaking the truth. Ow! Hold still! You wouldn't want me to pull your face off by accident, would you? When an ogre said something like that to you, even a comparatively friendly one like Dolly, you paid attention. Theo held still. So, you're the expert Tansy said he'd send to make me up, huh? Ow! Careful, you're smashing my nose! By the oldest trees, groaned Applecore, slumped on the bedside table. Can you two not talk without shouting at the top of your bleeding lungs? Someone's hung over, said Dolly, grinning. It's funny when the wee ones drink. Ha ha! agreed Applecore, you great gray shower of shite. 
Theo didn't say anything at all, because Dolly was rubbing white cream onto his face, and right through his skin onto the bones, it felt like, with a gray thumb the size and texture of an unpeeled avocado. For a moment he thought she'd pushed his lips all the way around to the side of his head. Then he realized they'd just gone numb from the pressure. What the hell is that stuff? he asked when she let up for a moment. White lead, Dolly told him. It's what I always use when I want to look like I don't have to work for a living. Lead? That's poisonous, isn't it? Do you want to kill me? Theo tried to struggle away. No, not after all the work I've done on you. But I'd be happy to pinch your face up until everyone thinks you're a stroke boy. Then it won't matter what color you are. That's too high up here. Applecore announced and flew unsteadily down from the bedside table to the floor, where she began walking in eccentric circles like a smoke-stunned yellow jacket. I feel like death, don't I? She moaned. How could you let me do that? Let you? I didn't even know it was happening. Theo turned his head to peer at the clock, then remembered he couldn't read it. What time is it? What are you looking at that for? The ogre asked. I isn't it a clock? They both looked blank. You know, a, a, a thing to tell time? A thing to tell time what? Dolly looked at Applecore, who shrugged, uninterested in anything but the pain in her head. My, my, you pink folk do have strange ideas. No, it's a charm casket. Theo tried to rub some blood back into his temples, where he felt certain he now had ogre prints the size of beer coasters. What the hell is a charm casket? Just something that will give you any little charms or cantrips you might need. Direction finders or hair straighteners or love stiffeners. She poked his side until he squeaked. That what you were looking for, Pinky? Jeez, no wonder I almost burned the place down trying to get the radio to play. So how do you tell what time it is? Those uh, big round things in the sky? Dolly smirked. Sun? Moon? You may have noticed. Okay, so I'm ignorant. We do it differently back home. Just tell me what time it is, will you? Sunwise, it's mid-morning, Applecore declared. You can tell because the light is pure poison and it stabs into your eyes like knives. She found a spot back against the wall. Also because it's the time of day when ogres and mortals talk the most shite. Og. Even my hair hurts. Yeah, said Dolly. I think he's done. Not top quality, but what can you expect? I'm sure you did the best you could, Theo said generously, looking for a mirror. I'm talking about you, not the paint. Dolly smacked him with a powder puff until he was choking, then brushed off the excess with astonishing gentleness. All done. Hit. She reached into a pocket of the voluminous something or other she wore, and produced a surprisingly small hand mirror. It seemed no bigger than a poker chip in her huge gray paw. For a moment, Theo wondered why she would carry such a small thing that then realized that mirrors for ogres must not be very commonly made, for obvious reasons. She'd taken a fairy-sized mirror and made it her own. As he took it from her, he was suddenly and uncomfortably full of what felt like pity. He definitely looked different. Dolly had curled his longish brown hair and put something in it that made it look more golden. The white grease had been applied with more care than it, had, than it had felt like from his end, rubbed in until it made his skin seem palely translucent. That and a subtle brushing of rouge brought out his cheekbones and narrow nose, his Vulcan features, as Cat used to call them. I look... Okay, he said, not perfect, but surprisingly realistic. You're very welcome, said Dolly. Sorry, sorry, thanks, yeah. Oog, said Applecore. Does that mean I have to drag myself up now? Or can I take another few minutes and get on with dying? As Theo pulled on the clothes that Tansy had sent for him, a pair of boots and some loose and serviceable earth-toned garments that he doubted came from the Lord's own closets, but more likely had been commandeered from one of the more human-shaped servants, 
Dolly continued to admire her handiwork. You do look rather sweet, if I say so myself. She grinned hugely, revealing teeth like crooked shower tiles. How about a kiss for good luck then, Theo, lad? Theo was seized with panic, but it was a strangely familiar panic, the fear of someone who wanted things to be easy when they never, never were. Um, you know, he said after a long moment, I, I, I'm really grateful that you did this and all, but, but you're not really my type, Dolly. Sorry. She looked at him and her smile tightened. You don't have much of a sense of humor, do you, Pinky? She stood up. Her head almost touched the low ceiling. For a terrifying moment, Theo thought she was going to wad him up like a candy bar wrapper. In fact, I think you're a bit shallow. You know that? She turned to Applecore. See you when you get back from the station. She left the room with elephantine dignity. She's right, but said the sprite, rising up from the floor like a helicopter with a bent rotor. She didn't mean nothing by it. She was only messing. You must be a deft hand with the ladies back home. Yeah, whatever. I'm sorry. Aren't we supposed to be meeting Tansy? It was bad enough having everyone back in the real world look at him like he was a complete loser. Now it was starting to happen to him in fairyland as well. Oh, of course. Wouldn't want to hold you up. She sounded angry. As they walked down the hall, a different hall, Theo felt sure, but it had taken the place of the one that had been outside his door the previous night, he suddenly caught up to Dolly's parting comment. Well, what did she mean, see you when you get back from the station? But just because you act like an utter mean Egypt sometimes doesn't mean I wouldn't see off, Applecore said quietly. I'm not spiteful myself. You mean you're not going with me? Go with you. Back to the city. That's why Tamsie's sending one of his relatives with you. What good would I be? Besides, this is where my fam my family lives. I'm just back, and I, I owe my ma and my dad a good long visit. Oh. He was a bit stunned. No, worse than that. He was devastated. He had taken it for granted that Applecore would go with him. By the time they reached Tansy's lab, Theo was feeling very depressed and could barely muster the strength to respond to the Count's greeting. Another fairy was with him, one who seemed somehow a bit younger, as far as could be told with such ageless faces, and was certainly a bit plumper, which meant he was built like a slender mortal. And he actually smiled, although he did not go so far as to extend his hand to Theo. This is my cousin, Rufinus weft Daisy, Tansy explained as he led them across the house. The day was dark outside the long windows, the sky streaked with charcoal-colored clouds. He's going to accomp accompany you to the city. Rather exciting, we'll be too, said Rufinus. Quite secretive, like the old days of the last flower war. Tansy gave him an irritated look. Something which you were not yet alive to see. In any case, let's not have any talk like that where outsiders can hear. It won't do to set people thinking. Yes, yes, certainly. Rufinus gave a vigorous nod. Quite right, Cousin Clivius. Oh, my God, Theo thought miserably. I'm going off into horrible danger with an upper-class twit for a bodyguard. Now, in just a moment, Heath will bring the coach around to take you to the station. Coach? And thus... Tansy told Theo sternly, we do not have much time for chat. Cousin Rufinus will have ways of getting in touch with me, but on the very small chance that you two should become separated, I suppose you should be able to reach me too. Using the public communications may not be feasible, so he reached into the breast pocket of his white coat. I want you to have this. Theo stared dumbly at the tiny leather case for a moment. At last, since it seemed expected of him, he flicked it open. A piece of golden filigree lay cushioned in the velvet interior, a slightly abstract sculpture of a bird about the width and length of two, abs two extended fingers. What, what is it? he asked at last. It is what we call a shell. It will give your words wings, 
said Tansy complacently. Open the case and speak to it when you are in dire need, and I will speak back to you. Oh, it's kind of like a cellular phone. Tansy frowned ever so slightly. It is a scientific instrument. Treat it with respect. He regained his bonhomie as they reached the large sand-colored entry hall, whose main feature was a sweeping, minimalist staircase. Theo hadn't realized the house had an upper story, if in fact it did. Hob, Tansy said, has Heath come with the coach? He is waiting in the courtyard. Then your adventure is just about to begin, Master Vilmos. Tansy smiled. He was pretty good at it, but still not quite convincing. Come, I will show you the way to the front doors. My adventure? Theo could not help remembering other great euphemisms of the past, such as a high school girlfriend telling him that breaking up would be a learning experience. The dark clouds had rolled in overhead, turning morning's glow to a midday twilight and filling the air with the wet smell of an approaching storm. It seemed to match the change for the worse in Theo's mood. If he had half hoped that Dolly and Teddy Bear and some of the other household folk would come out to bid him farewell, he was disappointed. In fact, even Tansy did not seem to want to linger too long in the outside air. As they piled into the back of the coach, which turned out to be something that looked just like a slightly old-fashioned beige town car, indistinguishable, except for some extravagant bits of silver and gold ornament, from a vehicle that Theo might have been seen idling in a pickup lane at San Francisco airport during his boyhood, Tansy spoke quickly. You'll do fine. Rufinus knows just where to go, don't you, Rufinus? Most certainly, cousin, young weft Daisy laughed in a confident sort of way. Theo shook his head in a mixture of confusion, confusion and resignation. He had many more questions to ask, but Applecore was crawling across his shoulder, trying to get onto one of the backseat headrests, and Rufinus was bashing him painfully in the shins with a huge suitcase he had dragged into the car. By the time Theo had figured out what was going on, Tansy had already slammed the door and retreated into the house, which looked much more normally shaped on the outside than he would ever have dreamed, a long modernist manor of pale stone, pagoda roofs, and not quite transparent glass. Theo flinched as a nightmarish face peered in on Rufinus's side of the car. It had a long horse-like muzzle and was a sort of pearly gray-green a skin color that went nicely with its crisp navy blue suit and cap. It had huge nostrils, but no eyes. Can I take that bag for you, governor? It asked Rufinus. The arms that came through the car window ended in gloved hands rather than hooves, although the fingers were thick and spatulate. I'll put it in the back. Most kind Heath said the young fairy with lordly condescension. Just that one. I'll keep the smaller one with me. When the strange greenish creature had disappeared around the trunk of the car, Theo let out his breath. What? What is he? Too loud by half, growled App Applecore from her perch on top of the headrest as he thumped the suitcase into the trunk. The sprite was apparently still feeling the effects of her overindulgence. Rufinus leaned toward Theo. Of course, you're a stranger here. Heath is a dooney. They are terrible ones for the drink doonies. Fermented mare's milk is their tipple, don't you know? But extremely loyal. And they're excellent drivers, of course. Uh, excellent? But he doesn't have any eyeballs. Ah, but he smells extremely well. I've smelled butter. Applecore was lying back with her eyes closed. Oh, the bleeding trees, my head still throbs. Oh, my God, Theo said quietly to himself as the chauffeur, with no eyes, climbed into the front seat and pulled out of the courtyard and its circular road, tires spitting gravel. Oddly enough, Heath did indeed prove to be a very good driver. After a few minutes, even Theo had to admit that perhaps vision was an overrated commodity in the chauffeur business. Whether it was his excellent sense of smell that allowed him to do it or some other strange trick beyond Theo's understanding, he kept squarely to the middle of the country lanes, made the turns without anyone shouting, Hey, you, go right! 
and stopped in plenty of time for processions of small, strange animals Theo largely didn't recognize to cross the road in front of them. Applecore had slid down from the headrest and crawled across the seat to find a more stable spot to sleep off her headache, curled on top of Rufinus's coat. The young fairy lord had opened his valise, which seemed to be a sort of laptop computer or the equivalent, though what it looked like was a shallow box full of mercury that eddied and rippled but somehow never spilled over the edges. Tansy's cousin watched its sparkling movements avidly and closely, talking and even laughing to himself, waving his fingers above it. Reading my mail, he explained when he saw Theo staring. The skies stopped merely threatening and began more active intimidation. The first drops of rain splattered against the windshield like fat, rotten berries, and within moments Heath had set the windshield wipers ticking back and forth. Outside, whatever beauty made this fairyland, as opposed to just any old land, was obscured by gray light and swirling rains. In other circumstances, Theo might have wondered why a blind driver needed windshield wipers, but at the moment he was using all his energy, just being miserable. It was nothing so simple as homesickness, although he was feeling that in spades, or even simple terror, which was in excellent supply as well. Dolly's remark about his shallowness was working away in the pit of his stomach. Was it true? Even Applecore was so disenchanted with him that she wasn't going to cut short a visit with her folks to spend time with him. So I'm supposed to be a, a hero? A, a diplomat? What? I didn't ask to come here. I didn't ask to have any of this happen. Just because I've got the brains to say this sucks instead of pretending it's some kind of wonderful fairy tale trip, does that make me a bad guy? Cat's pale face hovered in his thoughts, her dogged determination to add to the legend of Theo the Useless even from her hospital bed. It's always the same. You're 30 years old, but you act like a teenager. The shit you start and never finish. You're going nowhere job. He had to concede a few points, but he wasn't ready to give in completely. Besides, when people said you were acting like a teenager, didn't that usually mean they were jealous because you had more freedom than they did? Was having an all-consuming job you didn't like very much, like cats, somehow proof of being a grown-up? or proof of having given up on the possibility of better things. Well, nobody has to worry about my own going nowhere job, because I don't have it anymore. And as for going nowhere in general, I've certainly gone somewhere now, haven't I? He sighed. The horse-like face of Heath the driver surveyed him in the rearview mirror, or seemed to. It was hard to tell with no eyes there to meet his. You're the mortal? aren't you? Isn't it obvious? Mm, not really. You smell a little foreign, but that's true with a lot of people who've been traveling, if you get what I mean. Uh, yeah, I guess. Desperate for something to alleviate his gloom, Theo seized on the age-old diversion of talking to the driver. Suicidally bored mandarins probably did this with the rickshaw guys back in ancient China, he thought. So how does someone get a job? like yours. Ah, you know, it's kind of in the family. My dad and granddad were both hackies. That's what we do, a lot of us. Doonies, you mean? Have I got that right? Yeah, exactly. We all used to be road guardians. Each family would have their own patch and they'd take care of it, live off small offerings, reward good or kind travelers and punish bad ones like that. Then the flowers up in the city decided to be in building the interdomain highway system, and, well, we doonies fought it. Organized ourselves, pleaded our case in front of the parliament, you name it. I suppose a few roads might have got torn up as well. He shrugged, a gesture that looked strange until Theo realized he didn't have the same kind of shoulders as a human. Anyway, we lost. Now the roads belong to all of fairy, they say, whatever that means. It don't mean doonies, I'll tell you that for free. So we made the best of it. It was a while ago. A lot of us started driving like my granddad. We do like being near the road still. There was a note of loss in his voice that Theo recognized very clearly. Uh, by the way, I do know that we're almost, uh, that it's eight o'clock. Um, 
I, I've just got about another page or so to read, so I'm going to continue. There was a note of, his, a note of loss in his voice that Theo recognized very clearly. And how long have you been driving for Count Tansy? Well, not for him as such, you see, but for the Daisy clan. Pretty much all my life. My dad hooked up with him in the old Lord's Day would have been hmm, 600 years ago, give or take a few decades. Theo had to swallow before he could say anything else. And how, how are they to work for? Heath darted a quick, if eyeless, glance at the other side of the mirror. Rufinus was still chortling to himself over his valise. Oh, oh, fine, fine, better than most. Treat you pretty good, almost like one of the family. said Applecore. She levered herself upright and peered blearily from the folds of Rufinus's coat, then clambered slowly onto Theo's leg and up his sleeve, her wings waggling slowly. I feel like a bugbear just shat inside me skull. From her new perch on Theo's shoulder, she squinted out the rainy window at the wet country lane. Where are we? We've gone way past Oxai Station. We're not going there. Um, We're not going there, said Rufinus, without looking up from his shimmering valise. Cousin Quilius thought it would be a bad idea. That if someone should be looking for us, they'd certainly be looking for any trains coming into the terminal from Oxeye. It is the Daisy Station, after all. So Heath is driving us all the way to Penumbra Station. It should be usefully crowded because of the holiday. It's Maybon the day after tomorrow, he said to Theo by way of explanation. The trains will be very full. Fairy trains said Theo, still not quite used to the idea, even while riding in a fairy limousine. And what the hell is a Maybon? Stop the coach, said Applecore suddenly. Quick! What? Rufinus frowned. You heard what I said. Cousin Quilius wants us to go all the way. Stop the coach! Why? asked Theo, beginning to panic. What's wrong? I'm going to be bloody sick, that's why, groaned Applecore and immediately proved it. As Rufinus hurriedly opened the window and began flapping his hand to get some air into the back seat and counteract the slight but acrid smell, Applecore wiped her mouth with her arm and looked at the small mess she had made down the shoulder of Theo's jacket. Sorry, she said sullenly. It was those be damn berries. Theo sighed and tried not to look at it. He was in a car being driven by a green pony man with no eyes. He was spattered with cold rain and pixie barf and was about to be deserted by his only friend so he could continue on to an unfamiliar city with a companion right out of a Monty Python sketch. He tried to imagine a way the words fairy tale could be stretched to this meaning without destroying entirely. He failed. Yeah, well, he told Applecar, one of those days, I guess. And that's where we're going to stop. So just a few minutes over, not too bad. So, because we did go a few minutes, um, okay, so sorry, I stopped to read something, but we are past, so I'm, I'm going to make this quick. So just wanted to say, as always, thank you so much for showing up. I'm very pleased we're now out of the real world, or largely out of the real world part of, more of the flowers, and we're into the fairyland part, because that's, that's, this is the fun part. At least it was for me to write it, and it's, I hope it's the fun part to be read to, too. Um, and Forgive me if I forget dialects or <laughs> accents or whatever as I go. I'm just kind of grabbing them out of the air. So um, that said, I want to say, please continue. Be good to yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of others. Take care of your loved ones, your family members and friends, and the people around you who might need it, especially those who are lonely uh, or who have needs that they are having problems filling um, in terms of, you know, somebody to shop for them or whatever. So help take care of other people because the pandemic is a problem for lots of lots of folk out there and there's lots of folk out there who could use your help. Meanwhile, stick with me and I will continue next week. Uh, first reading will be Sunday at 2 o'clock in the morning my time and then again as 
now at Sunday at 7 p.m., also my time, although it's your time too. Remember that. Everybody's time is your time too. So with that, I say thank you so much and come back and visit me soon and I will see you next Sunday. Okay. Good night from Casa Bill Williams.